Ta-da! First welcome. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. How are you, you doing? Thank you, Steve. Most welcome to be here. Thank you. Thank you so to much. You I appreciate you taking the time. Not at all. Not at all. Listen, let's go through. Yes. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this. I appreciate you. You know, speaking to us on Real Talk. It's, no, no, it's quite it's a pleasure. A real, it's a real pleasure, actually. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Scotland's first minister, Hamza Youssef, is a lot of firsts. He's the first Muslim politician ever to lead a Western democracy. He's also Scotland's first leader of color, as well as the youngest to ever lead it. He's one of the first Western leaders to call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And so when we met on Real Talk, we spoke about his positions in Gaza and both the UK government's and Labour's stance on it. I'm looking at these pictures right here, First Minister, and uh, you're sticking up. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I do. Just a little bit different to, to the rest. How do you, do, do, you get, do you ever get used to this, seeing this picture right here? No, do you know what? Genuinely, uh, every time that I come here and I see this picture, it really brings it back to me. One, the responsibility, but the huge honour. Like, I cannot tell you how I feel mm. like being the luckiest man alive, being able to represent my country, the country I call home, mm. and, and having that responsibility. Um, so it's great. And I remember actually the first day I came to Butte House first night, mm -hmm. and it was, it was Ramadan last year. And so I had just done the parliamentary ceremony that's required to become first minister, and I invited my mum and my dad and sisters, and I think a couple of my cousins were here, uh, to break fast for sure. iftar. Yeah. And the photo was, picture was already up. And I remember my cousin saying to me, he was actually standing in that balcony just there, and he's looking down at the picture and he said, you know, Hamza, that's, that, nobody can ever take that one away from you. You know, and there'll be lots of pictures that come in after me, I'm sure, in many years and decades. What does that mean to, to you, come. just that statement alone? Well, I think what it means to me, because the obvious thing is I'm the only person of colour yes, on this wall. Exactly. And my name is different to everybody else's name. It sounds different, looks different. And I think for me in this role, if I could inspire other people who never thought the office of First Minister or any leadership office was for them, I hope they can now look at this picture or look at me on their television and say, you know what, actually, this role, this responsibility, yeah, I can be First Minister of Scotland. And that to me fills me with, with a great amount of joy and, and pride as well. All right, we're going to go up now and continue the conversation. There, there's a lot to unpack and there's a lot I want to get into. So again, thank you for your time. Uh -huh. Please, please. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so First Minister, I want to start off by speaking about Gaza and the personal side of things for you. I mean, we've all seen the story of your in-laws being trapped in Gaza. Was it like four weeks, five yeah, weeks? Four weeks. Four weeks. What was going on? Can you, can, you, can, you, can you tell me what was happening behind the scenes? It's hard to describe because it is unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. You said it was like the worst four weeks of your life. Easily, easily the worst four weeks of my life, of Nadia's life. And it was just not knowing minute by minute, hour by hour, whether or not my father-in-law, mother-in-law would be killed. It's really just as simple as that. Um, we were constantly in a state for four weeks as I say, 24 seven, seven days a week for four weeks in a state of real desperation, grief, shock, I would say, because we would be watching the rolling news coverage. And at times Nadia would see Derbala where her mother and father-in-law uh, were, were staying, staying, where the house, yeah. the family house is. Yeah. And she would be in, in tears and, and, mm -hmm. and grief stricken because mm -hmm. Darbala was under attack, and even when Darbala wasn't under attack, whether it was the north of Gaza, any part of Gaza that was under attack, it's fair to say that as a, as a Palestinian, Scottish Palestinian as she is, she is still in absolute grief. And Nadia cries every single day. Every single day as a Palestinian, she feels grief-strucken by what's going on. And the emotional toll of that four weeks in particular was exceptionally difficult because I've got to support my, my wife, I've got to support my kids, I've got to try to contain my own emotion because yeah. I'm finding it exceptionally difficult, I'm very close to, to my father-in-law and mother-in-law, and of course I'm running the country. Yeah. And not at any old time, I've got my first ever party conference as a yeah. party leader coming up, which yeah. is a significant moment. And I've got to try to provide leadership here because we have, of course, you know, we don't want community tensions to spill over here in Scotland as well. Uh, on the point of leadership, did it, did it ever, did you think about the fact that, you know, you are in a position of power and influence 
yet you couldn't get them out of Gaza. Yeah, I mean, it's the ultimate feeling of helplessness. Did that put things in perspective for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. In what way? Well, again, just as you've described it, here I am, by most objective measures, one of the most powerful political figures in the entire country, if not the most political uh, powerful uh, figure in the country. And I was not able to get my mother-in-law and father-in-law out of a war zone. And it took four weeks for that to happen. And that, to me, was a sense of real, actually very disturbing, that if that's how difficult it was for me, for all of the other people who were contacting me and Nadia regularly, desperate for their own relatives to get it, what hope did they possibly have? So that's why it was incumbent for me to raise my voice, not just for my mother-in-law and father-in-law, of course, their plight was of, of great interest here, but that was just the means by which to raise the voice of the entire population of Gaza as best we possibly could, given the human catastrophe they were suffering. Mm. And they have since returned to Scotland. Mother-in-law and father-in-law have, yes, four yeah. weeks uh, after, being, uh, after the attacks. Yeah. What are the most striking stories that they have shared since their return? Do you know, again, what strikes me is the, the fact that they are severely traumatised, even though they've been out of the war zone now for a couple of months. There was a story about fireworks and yeah, know, father-in-law well, jumping. Oh, completely, yeah. So they, they actually returned on, on uh, fireworks night, bon bonfire night, 5th yeah. of November. And uh, a relative came to the door to just uh, inquire uh, after them and I think to bring some food out, so it was very nice of them. And while my father-in-law was talking at the door, firework went off and he jumped. My father-in-law was a big man, <laughs> he jumped. And uh, he took it in his stride and said, that's going to take me a while to get used to it. But the stories are, are dreadful. I mean, uh, my mother-in-law tells a story, and uh, she phoned me actually, um, to say that uh, they thought they'd been hit. This was actually during my party conference. They thought they'd been hit because all of the windows had been Shat blown in, shattered completely. Mm. Mirrors in the house shattered, smoke everywhere. And she was phoning me to say, I, I, don't, I don't know where anybody is. I could hear screaming in the background while she was on the phone to me. And I said to her, look, mum, just like, take a breather. Uh, you're OK because you're talking to me, so you're alive. Right, let's try to find out what's going on. Now, ultimately, what it transpired was their house hadn't been hit, but a house nearby had been. And my mother-in-law then tells me in a, in a phone call later on that an eight-year-old girl uh, from that blast ended up in their front garden with a broken spine. Wow. So the blast had... The power of the blast. The power of the blast had thrown her I don't know how many feet into the air and unfortunately had broken, broken her spine. And stories like that, and then just the, the basic reality of the, the amount of times I spoke to my mother-in-law and the amount of times now we still speak to relatives. Nadia's, for example, got a message from one of our cousins still in Gaza just a few days ago of the basic reality of trying to get food, which is costing more money than they have. Uh, trying to get the most basics in terms of bread or water, clean water. The basics of um, what they're seeing in the hospitals, the trauma, severe trauma, it is to me really just incomprehensible. And what's most incomprehensible is that this level of suffering is being shown on every single television channel. Yeah. Yet the world seems either not to care or frankly not care enough to be able to make it stop. You're talking about, you know, your wife still having relatives in Gaza. Mm -hmm. How do you balance between the political and the personal for mm -hmm. you in all of this? Because you have relatives that are still there, yet, you know, you still have political duties to carry out. I mean, how do you balance that? Yeah, well, first and foremost, look, I uh, don't ever apologize for the fact that I'm a father and a husband, as well as being first minister. And I've got to do those jobs. Um, and, 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 they, and they are all part of who I am. Um, I'm pleased that I say a number of Nadia's family have managed to leave Gaza. I say please, but it's pretty bittersweet. Um, you know, they've never wanted to leave their homeland. Mm. They've been under occupation, they've had strikes before, shelling before, but they had no choice, of course, uh, but to leave, particularly those with, with young children. But we still have Nadia still has some family there, as you, as you reference. And for me, look, I try to support Nadia as much as I can, but I've got an important job to show leadership here in the country as much as I can. And look, there, I've, I've talked how, we, how concerned I know a, a number of uh, members of the Muslim community, a number of people who are Palestinian, and of course, wider society is concerned about what's going on. 
Uh, I've also spent a lot of time, rightly, reaching out to the Jewish community as well, who themselves are concerned, uh, worried about rises in anti-Semitism, um, grief-stricken by what's going on uh, in their own uh, country. And I've got to make sure, as, as leader of this country, I'm bringing communities together as much as I can. I take that responsibility exceptionally seriously. Yeah, and as a leader of Scotland, I mean, you were one of the first political leaders in the West to basically call for a ceasefire. I think on the 27th of October or so, you, you've yeah. written a, a letter to, to various uh, political leaders in the country, including uh, Rishi Sunak and, and Keir Starmer. Um, I'm curious, what was their feedback um, back I'm then? Not. I'm not even convinced I got uh, a response. You did not get a feedback. I'd have to look back, but I can't remember ever getting uh, a direct response. If I did, it would have just been the same lines that, frankly, you continue to hear um, at the moment, which is uh, from certainly Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives, their, I think, complete moral abdication in relation to the people of Gaza and calling for that immediate ceasefire. Keir Starmer's position to me has been of immense disappointment and frustration, um, particularly in the early days of the conflict when he was justifying collective punishment, for example. It just as an international human rights lawyer, somebody of his background should have known far better. And it was not just deeply irresponsible, but incredibly uh, ill-judged. So did, I, you, did you try to tell him that? I did, I did, and uh, we spoke. I mean, in fairness to Keir Starmer, he was one of the first to reach out about my father-in-law, mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. So when we spoke, I, I made it really clear that I thought, you know, he, he his position in denying an immediate ceasefire, not calling for an immediate ceasefire, was simply the wrong position to hold, uh, and it has continued. His response? His response, look, what I'm pleased in the developments of this week have been that my party, the party I lead, the SNP, I'm very proud that we brought another debate to the House of Commons on this. Now, our, our motion didn't get selected, of course, but ultimately, th bringing that debate, I think, helped to force Labour's change in position. Now, I, I don't think their position has gone quite far enough, um, but that change in position for now, I think, for the first time, calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, although they have a number of conditions with it, yeah. that would not have happened if my party had not continued to exert pressure bring that motion to the House of Commons. So I'm, I'm, I'm as well as uh, completely uh, anxious and, and worried and concerned about the situation, very proud of the fact that my party is being able to, to be the conscience of Westminster. I mean, do, just on that note, I mean, do you agree with the wording of the Labour motion? So because it was different than it was the different. motion. Yeah, it was softer on Israel. Yeah, it, well, it, it wasn't perfect. And, and we didn't like the fact that it removed um, the term collective punishment from our own yes. motion. For me, that's a really important point. The 2.2 million people of Gaza are suffering collective punishment. No ifs, buts, or maybes about it. And they have been for actually a number of years since the blockade of Gaza. But do you began. welcome it with a stipulation? So look, I, I welcome it because it's a change in position. The political reality is we had to get Keir Starmer to shift position. Um, he has not shifted position. He's the man who's going to be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in all likelihood. Yeah. So for him to shift position was important. We need him to go further. We don't think uh, he's gone far enough. As I say, there's a lot of conditions to his support of a ceasefire. But also, of course, he seems to be denying the reality for the people of Gaza, which is they are suffering collective punishment. Let's make no mistake about it, the people of Gaza are, and have for many years, been suffering collective punishment. Mm. When you see Rishi Sunak get up and say that calling for a ceasefire isn't in anybody's interest, what would you say? I would say it's in the interest of 2.2 million Gazans that are suffering. I would say it's in the interest of hundreds of Israelis that were and continue to be hostages who weren't reunited with their loved ones. Yeah. I cannot understand that. Uh, you ask the child who's been orphaned yeah. if it's in her interest, or the mother whose baby was killed, whether it's in her interest, or the father who has lost his wife and children because of an Israeli strike. You ask if it's in their interest, I think all of them would say it's in their interest. But I go back to my earlier comment, it's in the interest of basic humanity. If as a human race, we can watch what is happening in Gaza, and leaders are then impervious, leaders are then unable to call for a ceasefire, then I think we lose completely our empathy, and it is our empathy which makes us human. One of the biggest points of criticism against the UK government's current policy on Gaza is the fact that 
UK is still continuing to arm Israel. Do you have a certain position on this? I think that the UK government needs to stop arming Israel. Uh, we have seen... Needs to stop. Uh, they now need to stop arming Israel. I cannot be clearer about that, given some of the atrocious scenes that we have seen that are undoubtedly uh, breaches of humanitarian law, whether it's innocent civilians waving white flags being shot dead, whether it's the bombing of refugee camps, whether it's the bombing of schools, whether it's the fact that of course we know tens of thousands of innocent women and children have been killed, what possible justification can there be to provide arms to an army and to a government that has been responsible for such flagrant breaches of humanitarian law. How do you plan to carry on this message? Well, I'll be writing to the UK government on this very issue myself. I'll do my, what I can to try to exert pressure. My party will consider what more we can do to try to exert pressure on the UK government. It's a source of great frustration for me that the limit sometimes of what we can do is just exerting pressure. But I'll do everything, and including, of course, raising my voice what I think is an important issue, but I, I cannot see the justification for arming the, the, the Israeli government given some of the devastation that we've seen. And is there a particular thing that pushed you to, to, to come to this decision? No, I think... There's a collective. Yeah, I think there's an accumulation of actions that have taken place. I've, I've referenced them already, mm -hmm. which... Uh, and, and of course, the fact now that we have the threat the real threat from the Israeli government of doing a ground invasion in Rafa, which we know has millions of innocent men, women and children, uh, the threat of starting that on Ramadan, the holiest month in the Muslim calendar, to start an invasion which will lead to mass slaughter, let's not pretend otherwise, let's not call it anything else, it will lead to mass slaughter of innocent men, innocent women, innocent children, what possible justification can there be for arming a government that's threatening to do that? There can be none. How do you think the government is going to react to what you're saying now? Well, I'm hoping they'll listen. Uh, I, I'm desperately hoping is it that they'll listen. G given precedent. Look, I, I don't know. I, 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 if, I, if I stop, if I begin to lose hope, then we become fatalistic and I can't allow myself uh, or, or, or the government to become fatalistic. I've got to believe that there's a chance that we're able to persuade them that the right thing to do is to stop arming Israel. Mm. First Minister, do you think uh, a topic, an international topic like Gaza, is powerful enough to, to widen the rift between Edinburgh and Westminster? Look, I, I have never once gone into this issue thinking about what the constitutional implications will be. I'm not interested in the constitutional implications of, of Gaza. I'm interested in the community tensions that exist here. And I will work with anybody for all the political differences I've got with the Conservatives and Rishi Sunak and even with the Labour Party. I'll work with anybody in order to try to advocate for peace. In fact, look, Michael Gove and I had a conversation a number of months ago about how we can work together to try to bring those community tensions, try to simmer down those community tensions, bring communities together where we can. So I work with whoever I need to work with. For me, this is not an issue of the Constitution. It should never be seen in that way. Mm. I just want to go back to the, um, the, 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 the ceasefire vote in Parliament. How did you see it play out? I mean, it was called chaotic. It, was, you know, it wasn't British politics at its worst. Yeah, I think that was the phrase that uh, the Palestinian ambassador, Hossam Zumlot, used. It was British politics as lowest, I think, was the, the phrase that he used. I, I would agree with that. I thought it was just... You would agree? Yeah, I would completely. I thought it was just... Uh, chaotic farce and the tragedy of it is not just the fact that look, the speaker very evidently bent the rules after having pressure applied to him from, from the Labour Party and no doubt so that they didn't have to vote in the SNP's motion which included the, the words collective punishment. That actually is the secondary issue. The primary issue is the days after that, you know, and particularly the 24 hours after that, I was being constantly asked by the press about what was happening in Westminster as opposed to what's happening in Gaza. And that's the real tragedy, because Westminster was so chaotic, was so farcical. Mm. Uh, it ended Do you up think it was distracting from the issues Completely, completely distracted. And, and it's still 
seems distracted. But actually the issue we should be talking about is 2.2 million people in Gaza and those in Rafah who are now facing a clock ticking down to a ground invasion that could happen that will lead to the killing of many, many more innocent people. Yeah, I mean, the headlines that came out the next day were, you know, so one of them was, you know, Keir Starmer averted uh, or avoided uh, some sort of rebellion within uh, his party or within parliament. I, I mean, do you have a particular view? Because there were, you know, talk about reports of him going to, to speak to the speaker and trying to influence him in a certain way. I mean, there was nah. allegations, but do you have a particular uh, view there, on it? There's no doubt that the speaker clearly had pressure exerted upon him and the Speaker very clearly also decided to change the rules unilaterally, it seems, uh, after those discussions. But for me, I just go back to the point, the tragedy of the situation yeah. is that we're talking about Westminster process and chaos as opposed to talking about what is the real issue. But I also go back to this point that, for me, I've never been able to understand Keir Starmer's position throughout the last number of months. Um, it seems to me that it's not driven by principle. It seems to me he is driven by just trying to do whatever he can to negate any conservative attack, which he hopes will help him to, f to get closer to, to number 10. And to me, that's a real tragedy, because I think the real Keir Starmer, the international human rights lawyer, I think really he, in his heart of hearts, when he thinks about the situation, wishes he would have called for a ceasefire far sooner than the position that we've managed to, to get the Labour Party to. Hmm. I mean, it's being reported that his Gaza stance, Keir Starmer's Gaza stance, has, has, you know, could potentially lose him Muslim voters. Um, do you think his Gaza stance was damaging to the party? Yeah. If my uh, canvassing on the doorsteps is anything to go by, it's been hugely damaging for Labour, but not just amongst the Muslim community. I have to say amongst many people who, again, in fact, most people, I would say, who are compassionate, watching what's been happening over the last four months plus, and are really concerned and, and cannot understand why there are some politicians, Keir Starmer included, who refuse for so long to call for an immediate ceasefire. So I, I, mean, I don't doubt that, that they'll have to answer to that in the general election. And of course, people will, 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 will remember this during the ballot box. How do you think it'll play out in the general election? Look, for me, my responsibility is to make sure that the SNP uh, wins the general election here in Scotland. I'm confident we'll do that. It'll be a tough general election mm -hmm. for the SNP. There's mm -hmm. lots that uh, has been going on over uh, last year in particular, but also it's a change election and uh, you know, we, know, we know that Labour present uh, us with our uh, significant challenge, so we're not complacent about that. In terms of the overall UK picture, there's no doubt at all that Keir Starmer is going to probably end up being the next Prime Minister of the UK. The difference for us up here in Scotland, we know that Keir Starmer doesn't need Scotland to win the election. But Scotland absolutely needs SNP MPs to make sure that our values are represented in Westminster. Mm. And in fact, the ceasefire vote is an example of that. We know the vast majority of the Scottish public support a ceasefire. It was the SNP that managed to bring that debate time and time again to the House of Commons. Mm. When your critics turn around and look at you and they say, Hamza Youssef, you, know, you and the SNP, you, you guys are using Gaza to, to, to play politics. Uh, and again, I, I will get deeply frustrated and annoyed and quite upset actually at that allegation. Uh, you rightly referenced the fact that my in-laws had been in Gaza, Nadia's family has been in Gaza, continues, a number of our family members continue to be in Gaza. So uh, we are hearing day in and day out what's going on. I'm personally hearing day in and day out. And my position has been consistent. You mentioned there since October my position has been consistent. So all we've done is presented a consistent position time and time and time again. So I refute any allegation that we've been doing anything other than the right thing. What do you think you want to do next, particularly to Gaza? For me, we just have to keep exerting every iota of pressure that we can as an international community in order to see that immediate ceasefire. We have this clock that's ticking down to the 10th of March, where there are over a million people we know in that region, in, in Rafa and the surrounding region, and we could end up seeing the killing of many more innocent women, children and men if the international community does not step up, does not step up. And I'm afraid for too long, too many in the international community have been far too passive yeah. and maybe trying to exert pressure on the back channels, but that pressure clearly is not working. So there's now a need for the international community to think what it does to avert what will be one of 
the worst humanitarian catastrophes if the invasion of Gaza, uh, the invasion of, of, of Rafa yeah. goes ahead. And if that does go ahead, shame on all of us. Does it scary? Absolutely. How can it not? How can it not? You're seeing the same pictures I am. You're seeing the same children. You know, I saw a child wearing wearing uh, plastic bags on her feet as shoes. You know, I can see the same pictures of people begging for aid. And I see the same pictures of a father holding his dead child, asking what crime has she committed. You tell me, how can that not scare you? That these people are going to be orphaned, women going to be widowed, fathers going to lose their whole families. If that doesn't frighten you, if that doesn't terrify you to your core, then I question where on earth your humanity is. So am I scared about it? Am I terrified about it? Absolutely. There was a, b back in December, the Irish Prime Minister had a conference and I, I want to read you a quote um, that was striking for me. I just wanted to get your opinion on it. He was ref referring to the EU and he said, quote, we've lost credibility, credibility at the global south, which actually is most of the world because of what is perceived to be double standards. And there's some truth in that, quite frankly. Do you think there's a double standard when it comes to Gaza? Yes, and I agree entirely with the remarks that were made by the teacher by Leo Varadkar. At the time, I remember reading them myself. Uh, you know, and I say this as somebody who leads a Western government. I am Western by all, uh, any definition. And I have to say, it feels like given the West response to the situation in Gaza, we have lost a lot of moral authority on the world stage. People were saying to me, frankly, quite openly, uh, when I was in international forums like COP28, that the West has lost its moral authority to preach about be it human rights or any other issues because of uh, what, what, what is perceived to be, and, and, and I believe is, frankly, a double standard to how the situation in Gaza has been uh, dealt with vis-a-vis -vis other conflicts uh, that, are, that, that, are, that are similar. So I agree with that statement from, from the Irish uh, Prime Minister. I think Leo Varadkar was absolutely right to say what he did. And I know, First Minister, you've been very outspoken, but if we try to summarise your message, I guess the, the highlight of what you want to tell people in the UK with regards to Gaza, what would your message be? My message is a pretty simple one. We have innocent children, innocent women, innocent men, innocent people who are elderly, like you know anybody's grandmother or grandfather that's watching. They have committed no crime. They have not taken part in any attack. They are like you and I, just wanting what is best for them and their families. And they are suffering the most horrendous humanitarian catastrophe. They are living every second of every day with the most deep sense of anxiety that they may well lose their lives and their children and all their loved ones might lose their life at any second without warning. The world is watching and each and every single one of us will be judged. History will judge us and so far it will judge us very unkindly and so it should, because of the lack of response from the international community. So it's incumbent on everybody, whether you're the First Minister, Prime Minister, whether you're a citizen of, the country, of, of any country, it's imperative that every single one of us raises our voice and says enough is enough. A ceasefire is needed for the people of Gaza, a ceasefire is needed so hostages can be returned and reunited with their loved ones. And if we flip that question around, and this will be my last question for you, um, if the people, Palestinians in Gaza, are tuning in to listen to you right now, what would your message be to them? To the people of Gaza, my message is I'm sorry. I'm deeply sorry. Because you have been let down by governments. You've been let down by those in power. You've been let down by multinational institutions that were meant to protect you and we couldn't even protect children. That is the first responsibility of any government is to keep its citizens safe. And as a world community, as an international community, we have let you down. And I am so, so sorry how we have let you down. Uh, first Minister Hamza Yusuf, I, uh, 
I do thank you very much for taking the time, and I do appreciate it, and uh, I, I appreciate these emotions as well. And uh, mm. thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for coming on Real Talk. Thank you.